When people talk about the work of the Marx Brothers, the word that gets repeated most often is anarchy. But I've always found this a little hard to understand. Despite their perceived anarchic tendencies, the Marx Brothers operate on a very clearly defined set of rules. Groucho, the de facto leader of the group, cracks wise and talks fast. His wit is caustic and he's driven by an intense self-interest. Chico, the piano playing Italian, is dim-witted but kind and always on the lookout for a quick book. Harpo, the silent brother, acts as the heart of the group. He pantomimes, plays the harp, and chases blondes. And Zeppo, the straight man, stands in for us. He's the audience avatar. He shows us not only how society is supposed to act, but more importantly, he's how the brothers see the world. A better word for the Marx Brothers is irreverent. There is no subject too big, no topic so revered, no idea so sacred, it can't be cut down by Groucho's razor-sharp wit. With a career spanning 20 years and 14 feature films, the brothers created some of the most memorable and most gleeful film comedies, combining sight gags, slapstick, and wordplay. One morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. But they also imbued their films, sometimes under the radar, with an intense satire, commenting on all aspects of American society. But what exactly is satire? How does it work, and what does it have to do with the four brothers from the slums in New York's Upper East Side who grew up to be comedy giants? Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. Like most film comedians at the time, the Marx Brothers got their start on stage. Specifically in 1905, when a 15-year-old Julius, later Groucho Marx, appeared on the stage as a singer. Over the years, the brothers appeared in various lineups under various names, toiling the vaudeville circuit, fine-tuning their particular brand of comedy and crafting the characters they would play for the rest of their lives. The brothers became famous for wild, improvisational and often bizarre performances, but while their vaudeville shows had the brothers as their iconic characters performing the same comedic style, they lacked the social commentary found in their later work. In 1924, the brothers made the leap from vaudeville to Broadway with Alsatias, taking old gags from their vaudeville routine and padding it out with a longer story, new content and songs. It was a huge hit and it afforded the brothers a second Broadway show. But they knew if they wanted to become mainstays on Broadway, they would need to offer both critics and theatre owners something more than just gags and music. The brothers hired playwright, humorist and social critic George S. Kaufman to help write their next stage production, The Coconuts, and to infuse it with a satirical bent to appease critics, therefore legitimising the act and cementing the brothers as bona fide Broadway stars instead of lowly vaudevillians. This satire followed the brothers as they made their final leap to the silver screen. Their first film, a screen version of The Coconuts, was a satirical take on the California property broom of the 1920s and underhand business practices. Wages? Do you want to be wage slaves? Answer me that. No. No, of course not. But what makes wage slaves? Wages. Animal Crackers satirizes the cult of personality surrounding explorers and adventurers. Fear is not in you. Uh, pardon me, a caterpillar, Captain. No! Oh, my Horse Feathers takes a swipe at academia and university culture. Well, I thought my razor was dull until I heard his speech. And that reminds me of a story that's so dirty I'm ashamed to think of it myself. Which brings us to Duck Soup, the brothers' most satirical and overtly political film. These are the laws of my administration. To put it in simple terms, satire is the comedy of criticism. It holds a magnifying glass to accepted norms and points out society's inadequacies and shortfalls. Satire is sometimes confused with mockery, which exaggerates the flaws of an individual, group or ideal to bring it down to level. They're both valuable comedic tools, but there is a distinct difference. Mockery is destructive. 
where satire might not be constructive, it at least points out the gaps that society will need to bridge if it is to progress. Alec Baldwin's Donald Trump is mockery. It offers no insight other than caricature of Trump. Jonathan Swift suggesting that Ireland's poor should sell and eat their children is a satire of unsympathetic and cruel treatment of Irish tenants by English landlords, and it showed us a problem we needed to fix. Satire works by taking a person, idea, philosophy, institution, or anything else and emphasizing aspects of it until whatever it is, is shown to be absurd. It's by its nature a didactic and moralizing form of comedy, aiming to show its subjects as wrong, using nothing more than the ideas or the qualities it already has. It's not always easy for satirical points to come across. The effectiveness of a satire can be determined by the writing and direction, but also by the audience's receptiveness to the message being put across. It's difficult to walk away from blazing saddles without thinking of the racist town folk, the people of the land, the common clay of the New West, as... You know. <laughs> but someone might watch Fight Club and want to imitate Tyler Durden, without ever considering the problems with that brand of hypermasculinity that the character is a satire of. This was a major reason why Duck Soup and Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator were so widely misunderstood and reviled at the time, but came to be celebrated years later. Duck Soup takes place in the fictional country of Fredonia, a country on the brink of war with its neighbour Sylvania. The brothers climb to the top of the political system and lead the European country to victory against their tyrannical neighbours, and in doing so they shine a light on American politics, the dangers of a growing authoritarian power in Europe, and the absurdity of war. A common tactic of satirical works is to set their stories in fictional or removed places. Sci-fi and futuristic settings often work well because it gives the audience distance from the subject and allows them a more objective view of what is being satirised. The fictional country of Fredonia is a country of exaggeration. From its military dress, to its grand hall, to its national anthem, the country's European vibe means its critique of the absurdity in American politics doesn't cut too close to the bone. Duck Soup came out in 1933, the same year that Hitler was elected as Chancellor in Germany, and Ruthless T Firefly is a grotesque parody of the typical authoritarian leader. Firefly's power is bought with cash rather than with votes. I will lend the money to Fredonia only if Firefly is appointed leader. He's mean. Don't look now. But there's one man too many in this room, and I think it's you. He ignores the government and posts his friends to positions of power. Now, let's see. How would you like a job in the Mint? Mint? No, no. I don't like a Mint. Uh, what other flavor you got? He's incompetent. Look at them run. Now they know they've been in a war. Your Excellency. <laughs> They're fleeing like rats. But, sir, I've got the truth. Remind me to give myself the Firefly Medal for this. Your Excellency, you're shooting your own men. And he makes sure that his mistakes are covered. Here's five dollars. Keep it under your hat. Never mind, I'll keep it under my hat. He's so driven by paranoia and so war-hungry that he forgoes democracy and drives his country to war with an aggressive show of strength. I'd be only too happy to meet Ambassador Trentino and offer him on behalf of my country the right hand of good fellowship. And I feel sure that he will accept this gesture in the spirit in which it is offered. But suppose he doesn't. A fine thing that'll be. I hold out my hand and he refuses to accept it. So, you refuse to shake hands with me, eh? Oh! He holds corrupt trials and ignores the law to benefit his friends. My friends, this man's case moves me deeply. Look at Ciccolini. He sits there alone. An abject figure. I abject. And when the war starts, we see it for all of its absurdity. The great leader is blind to military tactics. The help is useless. Hey! and the political elite are held in relative safety while enlisted men are sent to their deaths. Harpo's enlistment in the war speaks to a resentment brewing after World War I, a feeling that the game is rigged by those at the top and those that have to do the actual fighting either can't see it or can't stop it. It's an no all good too. Oh, I got it, I got it. You're a brave man. 
go and break through the lines. And remember, while you're out there risking life and limb through shot and shell, we'll be in here thinking what a sucker you are. Goodbye, Mont Blanc, goodbye. Throughout the war scenes, the brothers changed their military uniforms from World War I to the Civil War and the French Revolution. What seems like a throwaway joke serves to detach from the absurdity of authoritarian governments. Instead, it suggests that this kind of treatment of soldiers by the establishment and the self-serving warmongery and the corrupt ineptitude of governments can happen anywhere, as likely in Germany and Italy as it is in a country like America. But the real satire in Duck Soup starts with the title. Duck Soup is a turn-of-the-century slang for someone who is gullible and easy to fool, as in, to sell someone duck soup. Firefly fools Mr. Mont into putting him into power. He fools the country into going to war, and he fools young men into dying for a government that doesn't care about them. Part of what makes the humour in Duck Soup work so well is how seriously Firefly and his cronies are taken by everyone in Fredonia. The entire country is turned into the straight man. No matter how ridiculous Firefly is, he's treated as serious by everyone around him. How about taking up the tax? How about taking up the carpet? I still insist we must take up the tax. He's right, you've got to take up the tax before you can take up the carpet. It's as if it's a joke, and only he and his brothers are in on it. In earlier Marx Brothers films, you would have Groucho, Chico and Harpo standing in contrast to Zeppo. We see the insanity of the three brothers, and we relate to the straight man. The straight man is a reflection of the audience. So when Duck Soup plays everyone in Fredonia as the straight man against the madness of the Marxes, the citizens of Fredonia are stand-ins for us. In Groucho's opening musical number, we see a satire of the duplicitous and contradictory ideas of fascist authoritarian countries. I will not stand for anything that's crooked or unfair. I'm strictly on the up and up, so everyone beware. If anyone's caught taking graft, and I don't get my share, we stand them up against the wall and pop goes the weasel. On the surface, it seems like he is making fun of a corrupt dictator, having one rule for his people and one rule for himself. But it's in the reaction of the people around him that we get the real joke. The people of Fredonia are so ready for a change that they're willing to look past Rufus T. Firefly's corruption and incompetence and even celebrate it as a strength. The same is true of the musical number that leads Fredonia to war. In behalf of the women of Fredonia, I have taken it upon myself to make one final effort to prevent war. War! Fredonia's gone to war. Each native son will grab a gun and run away to war. At last we're going to war. We're going to war. We're going to war. At last the country's gone to war. It is the country going to war. At last the country's going to war. We're going to war. This is a fact we can't ignore. We're going to war. The song itself is funny, but the real joke is how quickly the peace-loving Fredonians abandon their ideals in the face of extreme patriotic rhetoric and join Firefly in a war that they don't want and don't understand. Duck Soup is a direct assault on authoritarianism, so much so that it was banned by Mussolini. But remember, while it's satirising corruption, political incompetence and war, the real butt of the joke are the people who put up with it. Those that are so easily fooled by patriotic speeches and political grandeur that they give in to people who are corrupt, incompetent, or worse. In the eyes of the Marx Brothers, the ones who are ready to buy duck soup is us. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema, my name's Charlie. I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially my latest supporters. That's Philip Fayel, Karen Cooper, Gustavo Gandia, Jordan Palumbo, Maureen, P Twiggy and Yuri Gianella. Thank you guys very much, I'm really sorry if I mispronounced any names. The Marx Brothers were one of my very early film loves, and I hold all their films, but particularly their first five or six films, very close to my heart. So for a Patreon exclusive video, I'll be taking a look at the life of my favourite Marx Brothers. Let me know who yours is in the comments below. If you're interested in learning more about satire, I've included links in the information box to a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell, a video by Lindsay Ellis, and a book called The Marx Brothers as Social Critics. By supporting me on Patreon, you'll be helping me direct less of my time towards my day job and more time towards researching, writing, and editing these videos, and you'll also get access to exclusive content. You can find a link just here. You can find more of my videos over here, and you'll find a button to subscribe to this channel by clicking here. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.
Why, a four-year-old child could understand this report. Run out and find me a four-year-old child. I can't make a head or tail out of it. <laughs>